Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Thursday, August 17th, 2023. Scott Ritter joins us now. Scott, always a pleasure. Thank you very much for uh, coming back uh, on the show. Um, Thanks for having me. What is your view of the state of military affairs on the ground now uh, between uh, the Ukraine forces and the Russian forces? Well, you know, I've consistently said uh, on this program and others that I believe that uh, Ukraine will be strategically defeated from a military perspective uh, by the end of summer, early fall. Um, we're on course to uh, achieve that. The Ukrainians have committed their strategic reserves. Um, they're, uh, I think it's the 82nd uh, Airborne Landing Brigade, equipped with Challenger 2 tanks from Great Britain. Uh, German martyr infantry fighting vehicles and American-made striker um, infantry fighting vehicles. Uh, these have been committed to the uh, battlefield in the Zaporizhia front around the village of Rabatino, which has been the uh, epicenter of uh, Ukraine's counteroffensive. Uh, it was here that Ukraine, uh, coached by NATO, believed they found a seam in the Russian defenses uh, between the 291st Regiment and the 70th Regiment of the 42nd Guards Motorized Infantry Division. Um, but the, that seam turned out to be uh, the hardest scar tissue you ever saw in your life. It's held, the Ukrainians have gone nowhere. Um, just yesterday when this uh, brigade was committed, uh, one battalion of this brigade was taken out of uh, battle by uh, casualties. And it appears that the, that same fate is gonna befall this brigade and uh, the two others that were brought in as part of the strategic uh, reserve. And after this, there are no more forces. Ukraine is down to nothing. Um, this is the beginning of the end. Uh, we're in a situation now where Russia has maintained pressure along the entire line of contact. It's something I've been saying Russia would do. And um, Ukraine has been thinning out forces to fill in gaps in their line. And we see right now they have insufficient forces for the task of defending this frontage. Uh, in the north, in the area of Kupiansk, uh, the Ukrainian line is broken. The Russians are on the offensive there, taking 5, 10, 15 kilometers a day, uh, threatening to capture Kupians, which should fall uh, soon, and threatening Kharkov. Um, if the Ukrainians, and they will, lose this current bid in the counteroffensive, um, you'll see that the similar gaps in their defense will emerge, and uh, Russia will begin the process of pushing the Ukrainians out of the current uh, lines that are, that are held. This is the beginning of the end. Does all of this mean that of the uh, three lines of uh, defense that the Russians have created, more or less along the line of conflict between the two uh, militaries, that the Ukrainians have not only not breached, but not even approached the first of those three lines of defense? Correct. They, they continue to fight in what's called the gray zone. I call it the crumple zone. It's the uh, flexible defense zone uh, where Russia... Uh, begins, you know, uh, using its fire traps. Fire traps are, of course, a pre-designated zones for artillery fire, um, where they are using their their uh, obstacle belts. That's uh, primarily minefields, which they've laid uh, in in greater density than anybody anticipated on the Ukrainian and NATO side, and also mobile anti-tank uh, guided missile teams that uh, start picking off uh, the Ukrainians. This is to break up the attack, but. They're so successful in breaking up the attack that the Ukrainians are never able to reach that initial line of defense. Do you uh, surmise that the end of the conflict will come about uh, not by political decisions, but by military ones? In other words, are the, the Ukrainian uh, uh, chief military commander, whom you and Colonel McGregor and the others have said uh, is a serious military guy for which there is uh, much respect throughout the world. Might he very well say, this is it. I'm not throwing any more men into this uh, meat grinder and just go home. It's a little late in the game for that. Uh, he's just threw his last men into the meat grinder. So it's not like he's sitting on a large uh, stockpile of men to, uh, to continue to feed into. Um, I, I think that uh, Ukraine will suffer a serious military defense, uh, defeat, I'm sorry, um, which they're suffering right now. And, um, and then it, it comes down to how they want to politically end this war. Here's a reality. Russia has sufficient forces right now to defeat the Ukrainian army within the, the relative space of the, of the battle as it's currently defined. 
the problem comes, let's say, that Russia pushes Ukraine back to, say, the Nipir defense line. Ukraine goes behind that, uh, concedes Kharkov, concedes the north, but holds on to Odessa. Um, at that point in time, Russia will be able to hold that position. And it's a, it's a decisive victory. But Russia, as things currently stand, won't have the manpower to push much further beyond that, which means that if Russia seeks to acquire Odessa and Ukraine doesn't surrender, uh, that this is a conflict that could go into the spring of next year and compel Russia to go through an additional mobilization because they're going to need around 300, 400,000 more men than they have if they want to take Odessa and, and, uh, and swing through the south. Now, if they forego the north and do the south, they can do that, but that's a much more difficult military proposition. Well, let, me make, let me make sure I understand you. If, if Ukraine is running out of uh, soldiers, how could they stop Russia from taking whatever it wants to take? Well, if they fall back behind the river, uh, it makes their defense a whole lot easier. Right now, Ukraine is compelled to defend every square inch of front line. But if they fall behind the Dnieper River and blow the bridges over the river, now Russia has a problem because uh, they're going to have to build bridges to go over. Or they're going to have to come in from a different direction, say Kiev, and come down. That's a more complicated military maneuver. But Russia right now has sufficient force. And it appears that what they're doing is pushing Ukrainians out of the Zaporizhia area out of the Donbass back towards that river. Um, but then after that, we run into a problem because if the Ukrainians decide to continue the fight, uh, Russia doesn't have sufficient resources available to responsibly begin to advance. They learned their lesson last fall not to overstretch their lines. Uh, Ukraine will have the winter to rebuild a military, but it's not going to be a good military. It's a military that would be eaten up this quick and the question is, would the West, would the Ukrainian military allow this to happen? I believe that what's going to happen first is the military defeat of the Ukrainian army, followed by a political resolution to this war. What that looks like, we don't know. Uh, what is the quality of the equipment that NATO and the U.S. have been sending uh, to Ukraine? Garbage, 100 percent garbage. And we know it. We've admitted it. Um you know, we give them old tanks. We don't give them the newest um, gadgets that uh, that 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 were put on these tanks in terms of either armor upgrades, self defense upgrades, communications, uh, things of that nature. That's stripped out. They get stuff that's uh, that's 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 old, um, and it's also equipment that, frankly speaking, is ill suited for the nature of the of of, of the war today. So. You know, I've said this all along. I said if for NATO to give this equipment to Ukraine, we're literally killing Ukrainian soldiers. They would be better off receiving upgraded old Soviet or, uh, equipment that they know how to use. It's part, you know, that is compatible with their doctrine, their tactics. But we're giving them this new stuff. They don't know how to use it, and they're not employing it correctly, and they're just being slaughtered. Here's uh, <laughs> Russian Defense Minister Shoigu commenting on a number of things. One, the quality of the uh, Western equipment that the Russians have captured, and two, the level of either physical or moral uh, strength uh, of the Ukrainian army. It's in Russian. Uh, I'm going to have to read the uh, subtitles, and he's speaking rather quickly, just to give you a little heads up of what's coming. Here we go. In real life scenarios, our weapons show reliability and effectiveness. At the same time, the much hyped Western weaponry has shown itself to be far from perfect. You can check for yourself at the exhibition of the weapons captured in Ukraine. Despite the comprehensive assistance of the West, the armed forces of Ukraine failed to achieve their results. An example of this is the publicized strategic counteroffensive. The skillful actions of the personnel of the Russian armed forces, their coherence and the high level of training make it possible to respond flexibly to the implementation by Kyiv of the plans of their Western curators. Preliminary results of combat actions show that Ukraine's military resources are almost exhausted. Let's start with the uh, with the last point. Is he talking about the, the the soldiers being physically exhausted, or the supply of weaponry and ammunition being exhausted? 
Uh, both. Uh, he's talked about the logistics of this. Uh, you know, Ukraine is running out of ammunition. They're running out of tanks. They're running out of empty fighting vehicles. They're running out of artillery pieces. And they're also running out of men. And uh, the men are also running out of the will to fight. And that's an important part of war. I mean, I, I would rather have a Marine with 30-year-old uh, equipment who wants to be there, who's trained to be there and ready to be there, going up against somebody with brand new equipment who doesn't want to be there. I'll win that fight every day of the week. Um, the Ukrainians have bad equipment, and their guys, for the most part, just don't want to be there. Their best troops that they have left, the strategic reserves that they were holding um, to, to, to the west of uh, Kiev, have now been committed to the uh, Rabatino uh, fight. Once they're dead, there's nothing left. I mean, there, you know, there's a handful of motivated troops, but motivated troops can't cover a 1,000-kilometer front line. The vast majority of the troops are these territorials who have been, you know, bonked on the side of the head and literally shanghaied into the front line with no training. Is there, is there, and maybe there's more than one reason, is a reason why we have not given the Ukrainians uh, first-rate equipment fear that the Russians will capture it and reverse engineer it and find out what we have? I mean, that, that, that's what we'll say. We're afraid they'll find out the secrets. What, what we're really afraid of is that they'll find out that our best equipment's not that good. Uh, that our best equipment will be is easily defeated on the battlefield. And that's half the hype of NATO is that we're NATO, we're big, we're bold, we've got this new equipment, we're sexy, we're, we're better than you, we're better than your equipment. And what we don't want to become the reality is for the Russians to go, that stuff's garbage. You know, this T-90 tank we have is four times better. We have nothing to fear. And now you've increased Russian confidence that much more and you've deflated whatever advantage NATO could accrue by the myth of uh, NATO technological superiority. The West no longer has technological superiority. So the Guardian, so the Guardian. Of, of London quotes unnamed sources in Kiev saying or complaining that American F-16s are not going to arrive in 2023. That's consistent with what you said, Tony Schaefer said, uh, Colonel McGregor said, Larry Johnson, all of our uh, people who have uh, expertise uh, in this field. If the F-16s don't arrive until 2024, will there be a war going on? Will there be of any? Will they be of any use to the Ukrainians? Will there be a Ukrainian government there? Like I said, there's going to be an interesting moment sometime in late summer, early fall, when the current iteration of the Ukrainian military is strategically defeated on the battle, and we start to see the collapse of the Ukrainian line. Um, this will open up the door for a political resolution. Uh, if the Ukrainian government's not prepared for that uh, political, uh, you know, to bring a political into this conflict, it's possible they will be able to extend this conflict into the spring. Um, but in the spring, you're just going to get a repeat of what, what exists now. And the Russians aren't going to let up over the winter. Uh, they, they'll put the pedal to the metal. They'll put the pressure on the Ukrainians. Um, the bottom line is, I, I, I don't think an F-16 is going to fly in anger over Ukrainian airspace. I don't think an F-16 is going to arrive on Ukrainian soil. I think this war will be over long before that. But if they do arrive, it'll be one of the shortest lived uh, combat experiences of an F-16 in the history of that fighter aircraft. Um, Secretary General Stoltenberg of NATO made a very interesting comment yesterday. We don't have the actual tape of it, but we have a full screen of him saying it. So I'll read it to you. And I'm going to ask you, is this a crack in the wall? I almost can't believe he's saying this. It is the Ukrainians and only the Ukrainians who can decide when there are conditions in place for negotiations and who can decide at the negotiating table what is an acceptable solution. You know, this from the um, mentality of we'll give you all the equipment you need. You can beat the Russians. You're going to get uh, uh, Crimea back. No uh, negotiations until uh, the Russians uh, leave uh, eastern Ukraine and Crimea. Why is he saying this? Well, one reason is that the uh, there was a conference in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, a few weeks back where uh, 40 nations came together to discuss uh, the conditions under which peace could be achieved in Ukraine. And the, the foundational starting point was a 10-point peace plan that Zelensky had put forward, which is totally unrealistic. Uh, the surrender of Russia, the turning over of Putin, the pain of reparations. And pretty much the entire world told Ukraine at that time, that ain't never going to happen. You're going to have to come up with something better. 
Uh, just the other day, uh, Stoltenberg's deputy uh, in a freewheeling discussion said, maybe it's time the Ukrainians accept the fact that uh, they're going to have to make territorial concessions to Russia, meaning whatever territory Russia uh, has right now, Ukraine's going to have to give it to them. In exchange, NATO will bring Ukraine in and make it a NATO member. Um, Ukraine immediately responded saying, we will never give anything up and how dare you set this. And so this was Stoltenberg's way of trying to correct the record. But it's a very weak way of saying it because yeah. it changes the fact that the reason why the deputy to Stoltenberg said what he said is that Ukraine has lost this war and NATO now knows it. NATO knows there's nothing that can be done to reverse that outcome. So the best thing to do is for Ukraine to you know, eject from this, uh, this downed aircraft before it hits the ground. Do you suspect, just in your gut, Scott, that there's some back-channel communications going on, maybe with three or four intermediaries, but somehow connecting dots between Moscow, Brussels, London, Washington, D.C., and Kiev? No, I think Russia's been kept totally out of this. I do believe there's back-channel discussions taking place with Zelensky, trying to remind him of the reality of the situation, that this war will not go on forever. In fact, it won't go on for much longer. The West is exhausted, and there, there, there's not an infinite uh, pool of equipment that Ukraine can draw from. And sooner or later, Zelensky is going to have to budge. But the West has also backed itself into a political corner where it can't be seen as telling Ukraine what to do. Zelensky is going to have to be the one who says we're willing to accept this, this territorial thing. And so I think that's what we saw with uh, Stormberg's deputy, he was floating, you know, one of those uh, trial balloons out there saying, hey, what if you gave up the territory and we promised you a membership in NATO, forgetting that the whole reason why this war began is that Russia said Ukraine's never joining NATO. What part of if Russia's winning the war, do you think Russia's going to go, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead and join NATO. What the heck? No, right, this was right. never about territorial acquisition on the part right. of Russia. Here's, here's uh, President Zelensky's most recent statement to the uh, general public uh, in Ukraine. Uh, I've commented that he's doing an imitation of Claude Rains catching Humphrey Bogart gambling in, uh, in Morocco. This is his either real or fanciful uh, complaint about corruption. There are 112 criminal proceedings against officials of the territorial recruitment centers. 33 suspects, regional, city, and district military commissars, employees of the military medical commissions, abuses in different regions. Some took cash, some took cryptocurrency. That's the only difference. The cynicism is the same everywhere. Illicit enrichment, legalization of illegally obtained funds, illegal benefit, illegal transportation of persons liable for military service across the border. Our decisions are the following. We are dismissing all regional military commissars. Okay, so a couple of uh, uh, things to unpack here. What does it mean, all regional military commissars? Uh, and is, is the recruitment, which seems to be the, the target of this statement there, recruitment particularly susceptible to corruption? Well, the, the, the commissars are the people that oversee. You've seen the videos of the uh, guys in their... Uh, in their vans running around and uh, hijacking Ukrainian men off the streets. Right. Um, that That's the kidnapping that's done because they have to fill a quota. Now, why are you filling your quota that way? The reason is that the the sons of rich officials, the, the you know relatives, uh, businessmen are buying their way out of their duty to report. And uh, this has been one of the greatest corruption schemes since the very beginning of this conflict. Uh, the guys that are doing the kidnapping, <laughs> I hope their day comes, because they had to buy that position. They're guys that otherwise would be on the front line dead now. But what they did is they put money on the table and said, hey, let me stay in the rear here so I can go around and kidnap people. I'm going to pay you 30000 I'll give you a cut of everything we do. This has been one of the greatest corruption schemes ever. But remember, Ukraine is the most corrupt nation on the planet. Zelensky calling the military commissars corrupt is rich, coming out of his mouth, one of the most corrupt men in in Ukraine today, him and his minister of defense and everybody who works for him. The government just sees corruption, but it became a political problem. That's, that's what happened. These videos and the fact that men that are showing up to the front lines, when you bring, they, they, they had a very sad video of uh, they brought in a guy who was unable to pay the, uh, the penalty. He was clearly mentally deficient. Uh, his mother was there and the guy was walking, uh, looking, very, very badly, and uh, they found him fit for military service and sent him to the front lines where wow. not only 
did he probably die, but he's a liability. Um, the Russians, they're, they're showing the people that they're capturing now, and the Russians are almost embarrassed because they're, they're like, this is an old man, this is a crippled man, this is a man with health conditions. Why are they here in front of us? It's a bad thing. So Zelensky had to take action because it had become a political problem for him. Uh, earlier this week, uh, President Putin uh, sat back and uh, spoke uh, sort of in philosophical and historical terms uh, about uh, Russia and Ukraine and NATO and the West and the United States. It's in Russian. Uh, there are subtitles, so I'll uh, I'll read the subtitles. But um, I'm anxious to hear your thoughts on what he had to say, Scott. We can clearly see where the policy of adding fuel to the fire leads in the example of Ukraine. By pumping billions of dollars into the neo-Nazi regime, supplying it with equipment, weapons, ammunition, sending their military advisors and mercenaries, everything is being done to ignite the conflict even more, to draw other states into it. Hotbeds of tension are also smoldering in other regions of the world, and although the security challenges in each of them have their own characteristics, all of them are generated by geopolitical adventures, selfish neo-colonial actions of the West. NATO member countries continue to build up and modernize their offensive capabilities and make attempts to transfer military confrontation to outer space and to the information space. They use military and non-military means of pressure. And all of this is happening amid the destruction of the arms control system. The United States seeks, among other things, to adjust the system of interstate interaction. And that has developed even into the Asia-Pacific region. I'm going to guess that you agree with everything he said. Look, he's not factually wrong, and his tone is correct. Um... Uh, it, it, everything about that presentation is good. I mean, look, he's clearly reading from a teleprompter, but that's not a criticism. That's that's what people do. Vladimir Putin's a man, however, has shown he can stand for four hours in front of an audience and speak without notes, answer questions, and 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 speak coherently, unlike anybody in the West that we know of. Um, but this this was a prepared remo you know, prepared remarks. Uh, designed to go on the record. What I've learned in watching Vladimir Putin over the course of the last 20 plus years is that he knows the value of words, the importance of words. He's not someone to speak lightly. And when he speaks, especially in prepared marks like, remarks like this, every word is calculated for effect. Every word has meaning. So what I would advise people to do is not to, to push this off as uh, this, you know, political or politicized rhetoric. Um, every word he says there is linked to a policy objective, a negotiating platform, something of substance uh, that, that Russia is pursuing. Look, he's the only adult in the room right now, sadly, um, you know, on, on global affairs. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I think Xi Jinping uh, could also be called an adult. These are responsible leaders. I'm not saying they're perfect. I'm not saying their policies are beneficial to America. I'm just saying that these are people who um, act like adults when they when they get involved in these things. If you take a look at the West, we lie, we cheat, we steal, we mumble, we stumble. Um, there's nothing serious about Western leadership right now. Scott Ritter, always a pleasure, my dear friend. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, if you like what you saw and heard, and I suspect you do, like, subscribe, tell a friend. We're up to 183,000 subscribers. Our goal is 200,000 by Labor Day. You know what we do here on Judging Freedom. We're looking out for your liberty.